study of God's Word together today. You can open your Bibles to Joshua chapter 7. Um, if you didn't catch last week, uh, you might want to go back and, and check it out. It, uh, not that it was that great, it's just for context of where we are today. Uh, but I love that we get to jump into God's Word today. Every Sunday, we give you an opportunity to respond. This Sunday, we're going to have a, a, a very responsive response, if that makes sense. And you'll find out about that at the end of the service. So just be ready to uh, respond and um, just pay attention at the end. I think, I think it'll be cool. I hope it will be. Um, but uh, as you've got your Bibles open to Joshua chapter 7, I do want to share with you, I love, love, love when you guys uh, give us these cards, these uh, the Lord helped me point someone to Jesus cards. We've been praying that God would help us point people to Jesus, and I've asked you guys, share your stories. You can email, you can text, you can fill out one of these cards. We've got them at the Next Steps booth at the back table, in your connect group, in the office, wherever. But I want to share with you uh, Connie Miracle. Uh, shared this story this week she, uh, about Trista and um, Liam. And it says, my daughter-in-law, uh, who's not a believer, um, she is now looking for work and she's pretty stressed out, uh, you know, about, about finding something. And so I asked her if I could pray for her and she said yes. And so uh, Tristan and, uh, Trista, Liam, and I held hands and made a little small circle right there in the living room and uh, to take her request for wisdom and guidance that she was seeking a new job for. And, you know, Connie says, you know, there was no uh, commitment of faith to the, to the Lord on her part that day. She's still not a believer. But I pray, I pray this family crisis will bring her daughter and uh, her daughter-in-law and her grandson to know Jesus. You know, pointing people to Jesus doesn't have to mean that you tell them about Jesus, they get baptized, they get the tattoo. We don't do that, but you know, they, they, it doesn't have to be this whole bit. It can just be simply you pointed someone to Jesus. Amen? And we want to celebrate those stories, so thank you for sharing that. Keep them coming in, all right? So, um, Many of you know who Vince Lombardi is. For those who don't, he was the legendary head coach of the Green Bay Packers and is considered by many to be widely regarded to be one of the best coaches and leaders of all time. In 1961, he delivered the now famous speech entitled Winning to his team prior to them playing in Super Bowl II. The opening lines are as follows. Winning is not a sometime thing. It's an all-the-time thing. You don't win once in a while. You don't do things right once in a while. You do them right all the time. Winning is a habit. Unfortunately, so is losing. Essentially, what Coach Lombardi is saying is that winning is a choice. We choose victory by the things we choose to do. And the same is true of defeat. We choose defeat. We choose to lose by the choices we make. We're in a series in looking at Joshua uh, chapter 6, 7, and 8, three connected chapters, and we're seeing how the people of God went through this roller coaster, this ups and, these ups and downs of victory, defeat, and, and then finally renewal because they did things, they, did, they recommitted themselves to doing things God's way. Last week, we saw some keys to victory. I encourage you to go back and listen to that. Uh, we saw some keys to victory. Next week, we're going to hopefully have a very worshipful time. It's going to have a little bit different feel. I mean, we worship every Sunday, but we're going to kind of mix things up a little bit and have a, have a few more opportunities for, for worship and scripture reading. And as we learn about how God's people recommitted themselves to God, we're going to have a chance to do that very same thing. But this week, we're going to talk about defeat. We're going to look at some ways that, that we allow ourselves to experience defeat. And my hope is that we'll learn from this so that we won't be people who choose to lose. How many of y'all wake up in the morning and just say, I can't wait to mess up? I can't wait to just do things wrong. Of course not. But what we're going to see is some ways that we choose to lose. We're going to read Joshua chapter 7. It's not very long, but it's a good story in it. And we're going to pull some things out of it that I think God wants us to hear. Joshua chapter 7 beginning in verse 1. It says, But Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan had stolen some of these dedicated things. So the Lord was very angry with the Israelites. Achan was the son of Carmi, a descendant of Zimri, son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah. Joshua sent some of his men from Jericho to spy out the town Ai, east of Bethel near Beth Avon. And when they returned, they told Joshua, there's no need for all of us to go up there. It won't take more than two or 3,000 men to attack Ai. 
since there are so few of them, I don't, you know, don't make all our people struggle to go up there. So approximately 3,000 warriors were sent, but they were soundly defeated. The men of Ai chased the Israelites from the town gate as far as the quarries, and they killed about 36 who were retreating down the slope. The Israelites were paralyzed with fear at this turn of events, and their courage melted away. Joshua and the elders of Israel tore their clothing in dismay, threw dust on their heads, and bowed face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord until evening. Then Joshua cried out, O oh, sovereign Lord, why did you bring us across the Jordan River if you're going to let the Amorites kill us? If only we'd been content to stay on the other side. Lord, what can I, what can I, now, what can I say now that the Israelites have fled from its enemies? For when the Canaanites and all the other people living in the land hear about it, they will surround us and wipe out our name off the face of the earth, and then what will happen to the honor of your great name? The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why are you lying on your face like this? Israel has sinned and broken my covenant. They have stolen some of the things that I commanded must be set apart for me. And they have not only stolen them, but they've lied about it and hidden the things among their own belonging. That's why the Israelites are running from their enemies in defeat. For now Israel itself has been set apart for destruction. I will not remain with you any longer unless you destroy the things among you that were set apart for destruction. Get up, commanded the Get up, command the people to purify themselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Hidden among you, O Israel, are things set apart from the Lord. You will never defeat your enemies until you remove these things from among you. In the morning, you must present yourselves by tribe, and the Lord will point out the tribe to which the guilty man belongs. That tribe must come forward with clans, and the Lord will point out the guilty clan. That clan will come forward, and the Lord will point out the guilty family. And finally, each member of the guilty family must come forward one by one, and the one who has stolen what was set apart for destruction will himself be burned with fire along with everything he has, for he has broken the covenant of the Lord and has done a horrible thing in Israel. Early the next morning, Joshua brought the tribes of Israel before the Lord, and the tribe of Judah was singled out. Then the clans of Judah came forward, and the clan of Zerah was singled out. Then the families of Zerah came forward, and the family of Zimri was singled out. And every member of Zimri's family came out, came, well, was brought forward person by person, and Achan was singled out. Well, aren't you glad we don't live in that time right now? Woo! Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, by telling the truth. Make your confession and tell me what you have done. Don't hide it from me. Achan replied, it's true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins and a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. I wanted them so much that I took them. They're hidden in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. So Joshua sent some men to make a search. They ran to the tent and found the stolen goods hidden there, just as Achan said, with the silver buried beneath the rest. They took the things from the tent and brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites, and they laid them on the ground in the presence of the Lord. Then Joshua and all the Israelites took Achan, the silver, the robes, the bar of gold, his sons, daughters, cattle, donkeys, sheep, goat, tent, everything he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. Then Joshua said to Achan, why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord will now bring trouble on you. And all the Israelites stoned Achan and his family and burned their bodies, and they piled a great heap of stones over Achan, which remains there to this day. That's why the place has been called the Valley of Trouble ever since. So the Lord was no longer angry. Well, I bet you're feeling really glad you came to church today, aren't you? <laughs> this is a harsh story with severe punishment. And listen, I, I am so thankful that we don't live under the Old Testament law, okay? We don't live under this kind of judgment and condemnation. We live under God's new covenant of grace. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he paid the penalty for your sins and mine. When you placed your faith in Jesus, he forgave you. He took the punishment. He took the sacrifice for your sins. For all the sins you had ever done and all the sins you've done since and all the sins you're going to do, Jesus paid it all. Amen? You're forgiven if you're a believer. If you're not, you can get forgiven today. You can get saved today. However, however, what I do want us to see is that even as Jesus followers, we still can experience defeat. In fact, we do experience defeat when we choose to do things our way, when we choose our way over God's way. 
That's when we choose to lose. So as a word of caution, not a word of instruction, okay, but as a word of caution, I want us to see three ways we choose to lose. I don't want you to go out of here going, hey, here's a list of things I need to do to lose. Here's some things to avoid. Got it? All right, so three ways we choose to lose. If you're following along in your outline, point number one is this. One of the ways we choose to lose is to take what we want rather than accept what God offers. One of the ways that we choose to lose is by, take, is by taking what we want rather than receiving what God wants to give us. That's what's happening here in this story with this guy named Achan. Verse 20 and 21, he replies to Joshua, it's true, I've sinned against the Lord God of Israel. Among the plunder, I saw a beautiful robe from Babylon, 200 silver coins, a bar of gold weighing more than a pound. And I wanted them so much, I took them. That's what he says. I saw it, I wanted it, I took it. And now they're buried in the ground beneath my tent with the silver buried deeper than the rest. So the context for all this you weren't here last week or if you've you know slept since last week and forgotten last week god sent the people of israel to go conquer the city of jericho this is their first big battle and jericho was a mighty fortress there's no way israel uh, should have been able to defeat them and god's strategy was for them to walk around the city once a day for six days don't say a word don't grumble don't complain don't come up with your own plan just do what i say the priests are going to be blowing trumpets. The ark of the Lord's going to be proceeding before you. And then on the seventh day, you're going to walk around the city seven times. And on the seventh time, big blast of the trumpets. Everybody shouts, and the walls are going to come falling down. That's exactly what happened. And so the people did things exactly like God said, and things happened exactly the way he said, and they conquered the city. Now, the one thing God commanded his people is not to take any plunder from Jericho. Everything was either going to be destroyed as a sacrifice, as an offering to God, or the gold, silver, uh, copper and iron, I think, were to be set aside for God as an offering to him. But either way, they weren't allowed to take anything. What were they allowed to take? Nothing. Here's the cool thing. The Israelites obeyed God. They did things God's way. We see in Jericho, God giving them, uh, showing his people what he was going to do for them if they simply would do things his way. Everybody was on board with God's plan until a little bit later. This one guy, Achan. And we don't know if it happened while all the plunder was being collected. We don't know if there was a big pile of plunder and he was just like, <laughs> you know, we're not sure when he took it, but he, he took it. He saw something he wanted and he chose to take it. And in doing so, he turned down what God had offered him, what God had offered his people. What did, what did God offer his people? It wasn't just that single victory over Jericho. If you go back to Joshua chapter 1, we see the big picture of what God was offering his people. Joshua chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. If, if God's people would simply do things his way, this is what he says uh, to Joshua. He says, be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors that I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it uh, day and night so that you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid to discourage, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So what was God offering? What was God promising here in this passage? He promises that his people, if they'll do things his way, that they would possess the land. They would get what God said uh, he promised to them, the promised land. He says that they will be successful. He says they will be, that they would prosper. Most of all, that last sentence, most of all, God says that he himself would be with them. That was the big promise. God says, I will be with you. In other places, he makes a covenant with them saying, I will be your God and you will be my people. What I love, what I love is the same God from this story who loved his people and had amazing, awesome, incredible things in store for them is the same God that you and I worship and follow today. What kicks me in the gut, though, is how much like Achan I sometimes am and how much like Achan we sometimes are. We know, we know God has amazing, awesome, incredible things in store for us. But look at this thing I can get right now. Look at this thing I can have right here. Look at this thing I can, I can just grab right, right here. I don't have to wait. 
I don't have to trust. I don't have to wonder when God's going to come through. I can just take it. And I think that's why you and I sometimes choose to lose and go after the things we want, the things we can see, the things we can get by our own effort, and we end up missing out on something so much better that God wants to give us. Because waiting on God takes faith. Trusting God takes patience. Depending on God is difficult. It takes really believing that God really does want to do something awesome and incredible and amazing in our life. And here's the thing. I think that you and I, if we could ever get to this place, we, uh, we, we could walk with God in victory after victory after victory. If we would ever get to this place where we would wait on him and trust him, we would experience, this is amazing, instead of settling for, eh, this will do. We choose to lose when we take what we want rather than accept what God offers. Second way that we choose to lose is we fail to see how sin keeps us from the next victory. We fail to see how sin keeps us from experiencing the the next victory. One of the ways we can be sure to choose to lose or to set ourselves on a path headed for defeat is to live like our actions don't matter, like they don't have consequences. But God makes it really clear that sin leads to defeat. Joshua 7, 13, listen to what he says. God says, get up, command the people to purify themselves in preparation for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says. Hidden among you, O Israel, are things set apart for the Lord. You will never defeat your enemies until you remove these things from you. God makes it clear to Joshua and to the people. The reason that they were defeated at this tiny little town of Ai was because of sin. The reason, he makes it clear that as long as there is unrepentant sin, they will never experience victory. They will go from defeat to defeat to defeat to defeat. I think what God's trying to do is trying to get them to see sin as seriously as he sees sin. And I think if we're honest, a lot of times we tend to give ourselves a pass when it comes to sin. You know, we excuse sin. Well, I'm only human. I couldn't help myself. We, we minimize sin. Well, it's just a little sin. It's not one of the big ones, right? Like you've already got in your head, what are the big sins and what are the sins that are just okay? I can get away with that. Mm-mm. We rationalize sin. We come up with all sorts of reasons why it's okay. I can't remember who it was. It was I was a teenager or a college kid when I first heard it, but it stuck with me all these years. A pastor of mine said something about excusing sin. He says, when we rationalize, we are just embracing rational lies. When we rationalize our sins, we're just embracing rational lies about our sin. We're just making up stuff that we know isn't true, but it sounds good enough to us to give ourselves a pass. And when we do that, we, we fail to see how serious our sins are. We fail to see them like God sees them. We fail to see how having un, an unrepentant heart keeps us from walking with God. Now, listen, we all sin. Amen? If you didn't say amen, you just sinned right then. Okay? That's pride. You lied. Okay? All of us sin. We're talking about unrepentant sin. We're talking about hanging on to sin. We're talking about sin that you're just like, yeah, I know it's wrong, and you know what? I'm going to do it again. Okay? There's the oops, there's the uh uh-oh, there's the accident, and then there's the on-purpose intentional. All are bad, right? But what we're talking about here, what's going to hold us back is when God makes us aware of sin, and we're just like, I'm I'm not going to do anything about it. I'm just going to keep on. Whoo, Lord help you. When we do that, we fail to see how sin keeps us from the next victory. Thirdly, another way that we choose to lose is when we ignore the cost is greater than what we gain. Another way we choose to lose is ignoring that that what our sin costs us is greater than what we get from it. Check out Joshua uh, 24 and 25. It says, Then Joshua and all the Israelites took Achan, the silver, the robe, the bar of gold, his sons, daughters, cattle, donkey, sheep, goats, tent. I don't know how his wife got out of it, but she did somehow, I guess. I don't see her listed here. And everything he had, maybe she was in there. I'm not sure. And they brought them to the valley of Achor. Then Joshua said to Achan, why have you brought trouble on us? The Lord will now bring trouble on you. And all the Israelites stoned Achan and his family 
and burned their bodies, and it says they heaped stones on top of them. This is a great example of how the cost of what somebody got was, was so much greater than what they gained by getting it. Achan got some gold and some silver and a cool robe, but what did it cost him? Everything. It cost him everything. It cost him his life. It cost him the lives of his family. It cost him all the possessions they had. It cost the lives of 36 other men who died in battle because of his sin. All of that for some silver and gold he never got to spend and a robe he never got to wear except for maybe inside his own tent when nobody was around. Do you think if he, if he knew what it was going to cost him, do you think Achan would have made that trade? Absolutely not. No way. Gang, I really believe if you and I could get to that place where we would ask this one simple question, what's this going to cost me? As we're in a sin, what's this going to cost me? As we're tempted by a sin, what's this going to cost me? As we're about to dip our toe in sin, it's just, just my big toe, it's okay, what's this going to cost me? I, I promise you, if we could get to that place of asking that very simple question, what might this cost me? There'd be a lot less sin in our lives. If we could get to that place, there'd be a lot less defeat in our lives. One of the things that might help us remember this is the law of the harvest, the law of the harvest about reaping and sowing. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8 gives us a, a, a good warning. It says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. When it comes to sowing and reaping sin, three things that we need to keep in mind. One is that you reap what you sow. If you sow sin, the Bible says you reap death and decay. You reap what you sow. If you do bad things, bad things are coming. Got it? Not only that, but when it comes to the law of the harvest, and you're thinking about planting, you know, if a farmer plants a, a pumpkin seed, what's he hope to get out? Pumpkins, you know? If you plant Brussels sprouts, you can't hope for candy corn, okay? So you reap what you sow. The second thing is you reap later than you sow. When you plant something, it doesn't just pop right up immediately. You know, it's, it's weeks later that you may even see the first sprout, the first indication. And it's months later that you may get, a, get to do the harvest. But you reap what you sow, and you reap later than you sow. A lot of times we think, oh, well, I got away with it. Nothing bad happened. God didn't see it. Oh, my gracious. Nobody else saw it. I bet God didn't see it. God saw it. And you saw it, and you know he saw it, right? You reap what you sow, you reap later than you sow. Here's the big one, you reap more than you sow. That tiny little pumpkin seed goes in the ground, it comes out a big old pumpkin. That tiny little sin gets committed, gets planted, gets sown, and the consequences may be much greater than you anticipated. I think if we could ask ourselves that question, what's this going to cost me? And remember the law of the harvest, that I reap what I sow, I reap later than I sow, and I reap more than, my, than I sow, I bet there'd be a lot less sowing of sin, Amen. I know today's been kind of a heavy day, and maybe some of the stuff we've talked about has made you aware of some stuff. As we come to a close, uh, it's made you aware of some stuff about sin, about choosing sin, about choosing to lose. Maybe God's made you aware of a specific area of rebellion in your life. Maybe uh, there's something where you're like, you know, there, there's something I need to get right. There's some area where I've been experiencing defeat after defeat after defeat, and now I know why. Or maybe I've been fooling myself and thinking, oh, it's not that big a deal. As our worship team comes forward and we move into a time of response, I want to give you an opportunity to let God deal with whatever sin, whatever attitude, whatever rebellion, whatever act of forgiveness you need, you need whatever you need to repent from, whatever you need to turn from, whatever it is, I want to give you an, act, an opportunity to act on that, to however God's been speaking to you. Um, when you came in, hopefully you got 
Hopefully you got a, uh, a worship guide, and inside there's one of these little pieces of paper, one of these little uh, cards. I'm going to call them a confession card. If you look real closely, you'll see, and there may even be, oh good, they're up here. So repeated over and over and over on this confession card are some prompts, okay? You may have your own prompts, but there's Father, forgive me for blank. I repent of, I confess that, today I turn from, God I let go of, Lord I surrender. This is as many as Noah and I could come up with in just a few minutes. You may have your own prompt. This is just to help you. Got it? Here's what I'd love for you to do. I'd love for you to take that card, and when we're writing, when we're singing this song of response, you may even get started right now, whatever sin, whatever confession, whatever attitude, whatever it is, whatever act of disobedience that God's been speaking to you about, would you just write it on there? Don't put your name on it, Okay? If you want to write with your left hand so no one can tell that you're writing, I don't care, but just write that on there, and you can fold it in half if you want to. And we're going to give you an opportunity to get rid of that sin. Now, obviously, when you forgive, when you confess, God forgives you immediately. Amen? Okay? You don't have to do something physical on top of it. But sometimes it's good to have a tangible act associated with that act of confession to help it sort of stick in your mind, you know? Uh, when I was a youth pastor, sometimes at youth camp, we would take pieces of paper like this that we'd written our sins on, and we would throw them in the bonfire, you know, and it just totally got rid of them. Well, I asked Sean, he said, we can't have a bonfire in church. But we got the next best thing. Up here at the front, we've got some shredders. Back at the back, over by the tables, and over at the Next Steps booth, we've got some shredders. By the way, if you need one of these, would you just raise your hand? We've got uh, men who can hand these to you. You're not confessing sin immediately. You're just saying, hey, I don't have one, okay? If you, if you want to respond and you don't have one of these, raise your hand and we'll get them to you. Thank you, Joel. Just stick around for the shy people. But here's what we do. I want you to write that sin down. And you, like I say, if you want, you can fold it in half. And then during the response song, as God leads you, I want you to come forward and just stick it in one of the shredders. They're cross-cut shredders. Nobody's going to go tape your sins back together, okay? Don't confuse it with your offering. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. <laughs> and as you do, as you drop that piece of paper in the shredder, and it'll take a second or two for it to kick in, so just be patient. Let that be a reminder to you that when Jesus died on the cross for your sins, he paid for your sins once and for all. They were forgiven. Death was defeated. Hell was conquered. The grave is no more and you are forgiven. Now, if you're not a Christ follower yet, this is a great opportunity for you to come forward. I'll be right over here. You can say, hey, you can do what Mike did last week and say, I'm ready to believe in Jesus. And we'll pray, and you'll come, and you, you, you'll become a Christ follower today. That's the first thing that needs to happen. But if you're already a Jesus follower, and he's been speaking to you about some area, some sin, some disobedience, some rebellion, some whatever. Maybe it's a bad attitude between you and somebody else, and you know you need to forgive them, and you haven't. Whatever it is. In the front, in the back, we're just going to shred sin today. And we're, we're going to stop being people who choose to lose. All across the room, let's pray. Father... I pray your Holy Spirit continues to speak. Speak to me, speak to our worship team, our tech booth guys, the ushers out in the foyer, and every person in this room, speak to us. Reveal to us how you want us to respond. Lord, don't let us chicken out. Don't let us be shy. Don't let us miss this opportunity to respond to you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Will you stand with us? You come forward as God.